today we're going to break down the body language and behavior of Kevin Spacey. Greg, what else tell us about the videos you're going to watch? So Kevin Spacey went through a bunch of claims and a bunch of um, legal cases around sexual impropriety. And he actually got cleared of a couple of those. And he's back in the news because he's talking to Allison Pearson from The Telegraph. And he's going to talk about some of that in this video. A guy called Rory. He says, I just totally froze. He pulled me in closer and in my ear he whispered, don't worry about it. Dee, Dee, what, do you, what would you say about that? Is that true? It's not true. So what is the motive of someone like that speaking and saying that that happened? What, what, what's, what's going on there? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, people have different motives for different things they do. But I, I, I would say this, if I can revert back to the Anthony Rapp story. When Anthony Rapp told his story, there were a number of people who came forward to tell another story, a different story, because they, they felt so strongly that Anthony Rapp was telling the truth, this story must be true. Well, it isn't true, and it wasn't true. And there were other stories that followed that also weren't true, or there were parts of them that were true, or they had been exaggerated, or, or not happened at all. Um, and I can't really tell you why, what is it, it is that motivates people. I think some people, you know, may, maybe think that they're helping and doing the right thing. And, you know, look, there's, there's been... I think, incredible progress because of the Me Too movement. I think it, it started in a way that I think was incredible because if you look at the amount of time that the New York Times and Ronan Farrow took to investigate over a year before they printed the allegations against Harvey Weinstein, they knew what they were presenting. So I think, again, it's just a question of if you accuse someone of something, you, you have to give them an opportunity to be able to respond and to investigate it and, and not do it in such a way that, that you, you don't allow them to actually have a fair shot at being able to prove that either something didn't happen or there are circumstances that make it questionable. All right, Chase, what do you got? There's a huge misconception when it comes to experts analyzing a video just like this one. People assume that no matter what, and this is even my own mom and my own family, that all kinds of crazy body language is just exploding out of people 24 hours a day. In reality, uh, there have been hundreds of times that we've analyzed stuff and the behavior of deception was not there. So keep this in mind. There's a massive difference between truth telling and the lack of deception cues. Stress, stakes, good questioning and context play a humongous role in whatever uh, or whether or not these behaviors show up. But this is a simple yes or no question about the accusation being true. He's able to quickly say it's not true. So we hear that and it's not really a detailed story going on there. Along with this, though, you see lip compression, a swallow, a quick head shake, no these are sometimes associated with deception, but they are part of Kevin Spacey's normal behavior. We call this a baseline. So even in his award acceptance speeches, you see this exact behavior. I will say this, when somebody's falsely accused of something, they will not have a hard time calling that person out. They won't mind saying that they're a liar, they're lying, they're seeking attention, and most of all, uh, that they're committing a crime by telling this story. By saying this, it is a crime if it's false. In this clip, though, we're not seeing that when he's asked to explain these motives. And he's insinuating, uh, or I would say, let, let's just say he's kind of padding himself, or he's padding the accuser from judgment. He's protecting the accuser from judgment, social judgment, which is not a good sign for truthfulness. So if you're an interviewer, in a moment like this, this is the most perfect time to use something that we call the punishment question. Essentially, you're asking, what do you think should happen to the person that did this? That one question alone uh, will gain you so much ground as an interviewer. And the cool thing uh, is that it works as well on kids as it does adults. And you'll see that truthful people have no problem answering this question at all. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of interesting things I would say. That really quick, strong, positive to know, it isn't true. 
that's that's pretty clear. It's I mean pretty strong. It's not true. He doesn't defend it. He doesn't caveat it. He just says it's not true, and then moves on. And he shows some helplessness in body language when he does it. Face and shoulders are all pointing at the same thing. So this is a good start to me. I agree with you, Chase. People think that we can read minds or we see voodoo in this stuff. What we're doing is looking for patterns. So let's talk about two patterns I see here. One is when he's talking about, on the other hand, see his hands move, his head move to the other location. That's congruency, too. But one, the one I want you to watch in here is he has this body language of acceptance when he's talking about, I don't know why people do it. He does a chin boss, which you know can mean grief, but it also can just mean acceptance, especially when it's connected with some other stuff. What's he got to do? And so we see that in this case, and we see those pleaful eyebrows up at the center. I, I think what this is, and we'll see it two times in this clip and one other time, is acceptance. There's that first time when he's saying when people do this, and then there's a smirk and almost sarcastic when he says people think they are doing good. And the same thing again when he talks about Weinstein. You know, Weinstein was a good thing. This is, I think, his normal communication face of acceptance. We're talking about the guy. I, I've written about him in the past and said he has a concrete brow. We say the brow is the billboard of emotion, or I say it's the organ of connection. We use it to connect with people. He doesn't. And we see it a couple of times in these videos you're going to watch today. But if you want to see a great example of lack of forehead involvement, go watch him as Kaiser Sose in The Usual Suspects. That is a great example of his ability to control his face. Um, the last thing I'll go into is I will often say a person is trading guilt. People who trade guilt change over and say, I ran a red light when you're bringing up something about this case where it has to do with sexual impropriety. He doesn't. He says, I did do things that were inappropriate. So he's that's a different thing than trading guilt. That's a gradation of outlandish. And we're going to hear him say a lot of things that will wrap up in the end and say, what does that mean? But here I don't see a whole lot of problem. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you because we're dealing with an actor. You know, so a lot of people are going to go, oh, he's acting like so, you know, he's acting is or whatever. But when I hear that, it makes me laugh because you can do that for a few minutes. You know, you can act, you can, Mark will tell you, when you watch a movie, they're not acting for three hours in a row. What is it, Mark? Three minutes, five minutes, oh, two minutes could at be a few, time? Could be a few seconds. There you go. So you're really turning it on and acting. But here, when you've got this much time, there's no way you can, you can act a certain way that whole time or a couple of hours or four or five hours in an interrogation room. So it, since we get this question a lot, quite often when you see when people ask, you know, are there, you know, is it possible to be an actor and get away with this? Nope. Because it just a little while longer, you can get, you can get through all that stuff. As long as you can wait it out, it doesn't take very long. But while she explains what happened and the details of this, we're seeing some anger. We're seeing a nostril flare, a really quick, deep breath. And then uh, when he's asked if it's true, he says it's not true. Now, like Chase was saying, he, he said that pretty quick, and he's shaking his head no. But, and he continues shaking after that. Quite often, you know, you'll see they'll say, no, I didn't do it. But it, but his are, are are pretty good. I think he's doing a pretty good job on that, and he keeps shaking no. So that, that to me, says I, I believe he's earnest about his no, whether it's honest or not. Let's wait and see. Because all this looks, looks really good. Everything in here looks... Looks really good for a person telling the truth. And his head goes back a little bit and that chin comes out. So that lets us know that not only is he angry, he's, he's, um, what do you call it? Coming for, or being aggressive, I guess you'd say. So, um, is my sound on? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> Chase was <laughs> leading in just going, yeah, I like that. I was like, oh no. I thought oh, about that a minute ago. I knew you were on the cusp of saying as it should. I do. I, I was right there, man. I scooted right around and says everything looks as it should for this situation. So then I thought, oh, no, my sound's off after that when I got down to the bottom of that one. But anyway, um, so he's it, he's looking a little bit aggressive with that chin out. And uh, it's this is the behavior of someone who's been wronged, I think, is the way it looks to me. I'm not saying he's innocent for everything. I'm not saying he's innocent for this. I'm just saying the way it looks right now in this first video, in the first video, I'm saying, listen to me, that looks like everything is okay <laughs> so far. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. I'll, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so I, it's not true. I would agree with you. It's a very strong um, denial. 
there. Uh, I agree with all the th the elements you saw there, uh, Chase, the, um, the, the lip compression there. Also, I'm going to add to that a bit of bitterness in the mouth there. Now, is that bitterness because um, he's he's making this up? He's lying. Well, I mean, it, it's bitterness, and it could be the bitterness of being wronged himself, just as you're staying there, Scott. So I think we'll need to go a little bit further to work out exactly what's going on here. Um, his theory about all this, I'm going to praise it, is that there was a well-meaning contagion of stories which kind of spread out of this initial lie. So he's got this this kind of reasonable idea that says, or semi-reasonable idea that says, all these other stories came from people who were well-intentioned trying to join in on a story that came, but that initial story was a lie. And so for, therefore, his logic is, I think, that because this initial story was a lie, the other stories are not going to be true as well. That's either accurate or inaccurate or something in between. I don't really know. Uh, but here's what I would say. He then goes on to say, parts that were true or not happened at all. So he is suggesting some of these stories, which he say was, says was kind of a contagion of an untrue story, parts of those were, were true or didn't happen at all. Oh, so you're saying that some of these stories do have some truth to them. So look, here's where I come out of this, that yeah, it is potential here that he feels he's been wronged. And this initial story may not be fully accurate, but he is hinting towards there is some accuracy around some of the other stories. That's all I got on that one. Let's have another. Mark, you came in with confidence. Yeah, yeah I'm just, I'm just, I'm still, you, you know, go, you know, buzzing from that Diddy one that we did, you know, and the, yeah. and how I nailed it on that. So I'm just, you did. I'm just you sure did. <laughs> A guy called Rory. He says I just totally froze. He pulled me in closer, and in my ear he whispered, "Don't worry about it." D, D, what do you, what would you say about that? Is that true? It's not true. So what is the motive of? someone like that speaking and saying that that happened what what what's what's going on there i i, I don't know i you know people have different motives for different things they do but I, I i would say this if i can revert back to the anthony rapp story when anthony rapp told his story there were a number of people who came forward to tell another story a different story because they they felt so strongly that anthony rapp was telling the truth this story must be true well, it isn't true, and it wasn't true. And there were other stories that followed that also weren't true, or there were parts of them that were true, or they had been exaggerated or or not happened at all. Um, and I can't really tell you why, what is it, it is that motivates people. I think some people, you know, may, maybe think that they're helping and doing the right thing. And, you know, look, there's there's been, I think, incredible progress because of the Me Too movement. I think it it started in a way that I think was incredible because if you look at the amount of time that the New York Times and Ronan Farrow took to investigate over a year before they printed the allegations against Harvey Weinstein, they knew what they were presenting. So I think, again, it's just a question of if you accuse someone of something you, you have to give them an opportunity to be able to respond and to investigate it and, and not do it in such a way that, that you, you don't allow them to actually have a fair shot at being able to prove that either something didn't happen or there are circumstances that make it questionable. But you're not denying that there was never any truth to unsolicited body contact, uh, flirting uh, that went too far. You're not saying you never behave like that, are you? I am not saying that. I am absolutely accepting that at times I behaved poorly. And if anyone wonders, you know, why I would have done that, I, you know, I, yes, you're right. I, I was involved in horseplay and I was involved in interactions on set that were just fun. And I made a lot of jokes and, you know, sexual innuendos. And it was it was sort of more common in those circumstances than it is now. And, you know, I might have been having fun because everyone was laughing and that's what I wanted to have people do. But to have learned later in conversations I had with others 
and people that I worked with that actually they felt I was belittling them or making fun of them, which was were horrible to hear because I never, ever wanted to do that intentionally. And and those conversations have been really important because I've then been able to have those conversations with my therapist and try to get to the root of why did I do that and to make sure that in work environments in the future, I never, ever put myself in a situation where um, I ever hurt anybody or or my conduct is questionable. You know, the workspace is really um, it's a sacred space and it's and it's upsetting um, that that sometimes I behaved in ways that I will never behave again. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, so here's the way he's framing this. Uh, behaved poorly, horseplay, uh, fun, uh, fun intention, I think, jokes, sexual in innuendos, and he says all of that was common. So he's moving us away from this idea of, of any kind of sexual abuse and going towards it's just fun. Uh, it was poor behavior, not not criminal uh, in any way. It was all fun. There was jokes, sexual innuendo. I love the idea that he says, you know, uh, he would laugh and everybody else would laugh. Yeah, if you're Kevin Spacey and you're laughing, I think everybody else will be laughing because most likely you own their paycheck. And so it seems to me there's a, there, and this will continue, a, a kind of an odd naivety in him, kind of understanding that, if he does certain things and he suggests they're funny, that people are going to join in and agree that they're funny because he is the high, he's the king. <laughs> he's the highest status. And in London, he was running a really important um, uh, theatre, really important uh, theatre, and also at the same time had an in a huge show on Netflix and could uh, give out jobs around that. So we'll hear about that all later. But an uh, interesting reframe on this. Uh, never put myself in a situation, he says. Well, he was creating all the situations. He's in charge of all these situations. He is as high as you can possibly get. So any situation is really in his control. Again, seems naive the way he puts that. Uh, and then he creates, uh, again, uh, Greg, sacred space, not not non-verbally, but verbally to say the um, sanctification of the work, that the work the theatre work was a holy place and he would never want that sanctity broken in any way. So, you know, this king has has gone, it's, you know, I guess because everybody was, I was laughing and everybody else was laughing, they must have thought it was good and were joining in. That's never going to be true. And then he makes it a very holy space as well. So we can't puncture that. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, a couple of things as we start. You say he's got naivete here. The person who is abusing other people can get away with that. They can have naivete about what's going on. The reason there are equal opportunity laws, the reason there are anti-sexual harassment laws, the reason the military is so deadly on all of those things is because often the person will see no harm in it because they're not the victim in this case. And power and asymmetric relationships create a victim, regardless of whatever else we want to call it, if a person's too young to be involved in that situation or whatever. So I'll start off by saying that. A couple of things I see here, I think he is apologetic, but I don't know that he is reformed. I don't know that he sees why there's a problem based on what I see here. He starts off by adapting at the back of his neck or his head when they ask about bad behavior. She's putting him on notice and you can see that he's starting to go, hold on a second. She says, you're not saying at one point. He does long vowels, those long vowels for fishing for approval at horse play, interactions, and then he that's just minimizing the impact of what you're doing using that kind of language softens what's going on. Now, I'm also going to say that probably was not abnormal in the environment, just like the reason we have laws for sexual harassment in the workplace and in the military is because at one point that was fairly normal in the world that people lived in. Lots of young women in situations like that back in business in the olden days, you know, I would say it was not since I've been around because a lot of EO stuff there. But anyway, at the end of the day, then there's at innuendo, he does a single shoulder shrug and innuendo with that long vowel. So he knows this guy's, Mark, if, it, if it's naivete, it's intentional naivete. He's a smart guy. There's contempt when he's talking about it belittling or making fun of. And remember, the reason I pointed out that face of acceptance with that chin boss twice, it doesn't show up here. If that was something he's accepting, you would think we would see that same face. We don't. Is it possible that it means nothing? Yeah, possible. But go back and look at that video one and see that acceptance face at Weinstein, that acceptance face at the Me Too thing. It's not here. 
Um, he does mouth blocking after intentionally. And there's a whole lot of face touching, pressing when he says, I never put myself in a situation where I hurt someone with my conduct. I behaved in ways I will never behave again. I don't hear anything in there that says, hey, I know this is wrong. I knew this was wrong. We don't hear any of that. So I think, Mark, that's why the naivete comes across. And just because you obey laws doesn't mean that you agree with them. All of us know that. There's some laws some of us may not agree with, but we obey. Once you're in a situation where you have to, you do it. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. For me, this is where it gets interesting because so far we've seen no cues of deception, really. I mean, nothing really stands out. You know, ah, look at this, look at that. A lot. He, he does a lot of the little short shoulder shrugs and the single ones, but I think that's part of his baseline as well because he's doing that all the time through here. So it looks like, to me, like he's checking his notes right there to the right of his screen. Is it his right or his left? Yeah, I think it's to the right. I don't know. I'm dyslexic. Um, so it looks like he's looking at something to, to kind of go over whatever she may ask. I think he's got a block of a few words to check on. It looks like that anyway. So in a way, he adds too much information about the inst instances of behavior that made people uncomfortable for me. It's like he's burying the lead. That question comes up and he starts piling all this stuff on here. And Greg uh, coined the phrase chaff and redirect. I think this this might be a form of that because he's he's not saying uh, he's leaving that part in there that she's talking about, but he's just adding all this other stuff on top of it. He's burying that surrounding it with it and putting things on top and under and around it to sort of hide it, I think. So everything is, it looks the way it should because I think he's being honest about the other things as well. And he ends by saying there are things he'd never do again. And he says his behavior was bad. So there's something in here where he shouldn't have been, he's been doing something he shouldn't have been doing. So maybe we'll find out what that is later on. Chase, what do you got? So there's a lot going on here. And I think it's genuine, but keep in mind that he's not making a denial about the sexual assault directly. So keep that in mind. So I think what's, what is in this clip, the statements that are in this clip are honest. What I thought was remarkable was the degree of real emotional authenticity uh, in his description of learning that he had offended or hurt somebody by the jokes or remarks. That was real. The, there was an eyebrow flash as he's describing how they felt, the, this hand-to-chest gesture, which we do uh, unconsciously when we're being vulnerable or, or genuine with somebody. You see a grief muscle, and you see this little uh, thing here squeezed together. That's called the glabella. But it stays furrowed during uh, an apology or an explanation like this, when that happens, it's usually genuine concern, confusion, or distress. One of those things. Kevin is genuinely, I, I, I think, feeling remorseful or troubled, remorseful or troubled about the impact of his actions. The glabella is more involved here uh, in this admission uh, because the confusion and distress and Probably pretty often self-criticism. You'll see the glabella during times of self-criticism. If you want to look up the scientific research on this, Paul Ekman did some major work on this and published the studies that revealed this stuff initially to the Western world anyway. That's all I got. But you're not denying that there was never any truth to unsolicited body contact, uh, flirting uh, that went too far. You're not saying you never behave like that, are you? I am not saying that. I am absolutely accepting that at times I behaved poorly. And if anyone wonders, you know, why I would have done that, I, you know, I, yes, you're right. I, I was involved in horseplay and I was involved in interactions on set that were just fun. And I made a lot of jokes and, you know, sexual innuendos. And it was it was sort of more common in those circumstances than it is now. And, you know, I might have been having fun because everyone was laughing and that's what I wanted to have people do. But to have learned later in conversations I had with others and people that I worked with that actually they felt I was belittling them or making fun of them, which was were horrible to hear because I never, ever wanted to do that intentionally. And and those conversations have been really important because I've then been able to have those conversations with my therapist and try to get to the root of why did I do that and to make sure that in work environments in the future, I never, ever put myself in a situation where um, 
I ever hurt anybody or, or my conduct is questionable. You know, the workspace is really, um, it's a sacred space and it's, and it's upsetting um, that, that sometimes I behaved in ways that I will never behave again. There's also one guy in the documentary um, who was um, uh, had a small part on House of Cards, who um, was gets very distressed about talking about you uh, touching him inappropriately, and then I believe several months later shared half nude photographs with you. Is is that no? Correct? Actually, actually, the accusation he made was in 2013, right? And the photographs that he sent me which were provocative, uh, was in 2016 after he had left the show. Okay. So you would have thought you were on pretty okay terms with him, would you? Absolutely. We were very friendly to each other. And at no time did he ever say that any of our uh, a horseplay had upset him in any way, shape or form. Mark, when she said this was going, so House of Cards was in London? Is that what you were referring to? Uh, no, House of Cards was the Netflix show, which right. was being produced Great at show. the same time as him uh, running the Old Vic in, in London, on south of London. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, cool. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, he knows that he's got this guy nailed. That under He's undermined his credibility. You can't miss it because his chin boss that engaging in acceptance. Again, the same thing we saw earlier, not sad, not grief, just that chin boss involved when he's when he raises his shoulder like, so what's a guy to do? And he enunciates every point, 2016, left the show, and then Chase, he does your closed eye talking, closes his eyes, does a lip compression. I put that one down. That's done. I think he's irritated now because he's adapting by rocking as he answers more questions about this. I think he can feel this thing is taking a turn and she's starting to push a little harder and you can see him adapt by swaying his body. But adapt, we simply mean taking control of the environment by doing the familiar in an unfamiliar space. It's what we all do. And then at the end of that, he goes right back to that. I rest my case with his eyes closed and lip compression. I think he's he, this one. He just no biggie. I've got this one nailed. I'm not worried about it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, when we when we talk about the grief muscle, Greg can do it if you could demonstrate really quick. It, it's that little muscle right up here, that little that little thing. It's, it's hard. Muscles, yeah. It's hard to fake. It's hard to do. When we talk about the grief muscle, watch the center of this woman's forehead when she's recalling this emotional experience of hearing this guy talk about stuff on the documentary. It's real. So I don't know about this case at all, uh, but I do know behavior. This denial is lacking. Uh, almost all of the things I would look for when it comes to deception. To give you a quick rundown of what we look for or what I look for is number one is change. I'm looking for unusual stuff based on how they normally act. Then context, always considering the setting, the circumstances, what's going on that might be influencing somebody, then clusters. So instead of relying on a single behavior, I always want to find multiple things going on because the body is begging to tell the truth. The next one is culture. This is behavioral backgrounds, the, where the person grew up or the city that this is taking place in, all kinds of stuff that goes on there. And then the checklist. This is the checklist that's more systematic. Here's the list of what we think is a deceptive behavior. And then we do that last. And so that's an in-order list of what I look for. I think what everybody here looks for. That's an in-order list. That's all I got. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, actually, let's talk a little bit about culture and the metaphor that he uses here of horseplay. And so uh, I think probably only Greg here, or certainly Greg, would know more about horses playing than most all of us here. Uh, others of us may well have seen a bit of horses playing, but Greg's probably seen quite a lot of it. But this this metaphor is th thrown out. He says, look, there was some horseplay going on. And so for us, we take in this image. So it's a, it's a metaphor, which means it's calling something something that it is not. There were no horses involved in, in the action that was going on. He throws out the metaphor of horseplay. And I certainly in my mind get this image of two horses kind of playing with each other and it's all over and no harm done. And that's the nature of horseplay because we kind of go, oh, it's just horseplay. Oh, well, no harm done. Greg, 
I'm sure you've seen some horse play in your time and it probably hasn't ended very well at all. Uh, I mean, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it can get quite nasty because my guess is in horse play, actual horse play, probably one horse turns out to be way more powerful than the other horse. And and it's it's not go- often going to be equal horses. He's suggesting, look, it's horse play, it's equal horses. Probably wasn't equal horses. Probably one of the horses in the play had way more power than some of the other horses. And therefore, what looked to him like acceptance um, probably was compliance instead. And again, it seems naive that he doesn't seem to understand this, that what he's seen as acceptance in horseplay, we were just playing around, could well be compliance because of the extreme imbalance of status involved. But Greg, I'd be happy for you to tell me if I've read horseplay wrongly. No, I, I just what I'm thinking about is a very famous person who said it was horseplay. That was Jerry Sandusky. Yeah. Remember that big problem. So, yeah, but Mark, you're right. I mean, horses, it's usually, oddly enough, male horses that do that, mostly grabbing and pulling on halters. Mares don't do a whole lot of that. They're like, get off me. They can be very grumpy and very aggressive with each other. But, yeah, it's it's the truth. One will be stronger than the other. They'll play around until they've had enough. Of it. Yeah. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. <clears throat> now he's talking about horseplay in a different arena. Uh, I mean? <laughs> so earlier it sounded like horseplay meant just goofing around and telling jokes and, and that kind of thing. Now we find out there's behavior going on involving questionable photos and it refers to that as horseplay. So he's sort of up the game a little bit on what horseplay actually is in his in his world or whatever. So moments here or his, his movements here. There are moments when it's it's much fat. They're much faster than normal. I mean, he comes out of the gate, everything's sped up a little bit, and and he's a little jerking around a little bit there, but not not a whole lot. But he but he's he's uncomfortable, and we got a lot more shoulder shrugs, a lot more uh, expressions just flashing across his face. There's a whole bunch of them. So there's a lot of inner dialogue going on up there as he's thinking about what's happening. I think so, and I agree with you, Greg. She's he she's sort of starting to put the heat on him with this thing. And he's starting to leak a little bit there. So, and then, and then in the, if you look at the reflection in his glasses, you can see what he's seeing on the screen. You know, it's more than just himself and more than just her. And quite often, as we all know, when you're, you're doing TV news, uh, you get on there and they put you in a little green room and then you can see the show going on. You can see two or three different things. And then when you're talking, sometimes there's three or four other things going on, but you have to pretend like it's just just you and and talking to the news person or whatever. So I, I can't tell what's going on there. I'm looking for that thing. It's going to, to show me for sure he's reading stuff. So, but at this point we don't see he's actually reading, but it looks like he's checking on something there to his, to his right. So I'm, I'm going to, we'll keep looking and see if we can find those in his glasses or some other way. Um, so what's being discussed, I think might've happened, but it sounds like both parties were okay with it when I went along because um, it's been years since the the guy who was a kid back then comes up and shows and shows these pictures, but I'm sure he's gone away and thought about it and said, you know what, that wasn't right what he did. Because as you get older, you start realizing things that that was weird. You know, for when you're a little kid, you go, that just wasn't right. Right now that I think about it, and it sort of clicks. Maybe that's what's happened here. And that that guy back when he was a kid, this happened. Now he's a little older. He went, you know what, that wasn't cool. That wasn't right what he did. So that's a possibility of what may be happening. There's also one guy in the documentary um, who was um, uh, had a small part on House of Cards, who um, was gets very distressed about talking about you uh, touching him inappropriately, and then I believe several months later shared half nude photographs with you. Is is that no? Correct? Actually, actually, the accusation he made was in 2013. Right. And the photographs that he sent me, which were provocative, uh, was in 2016 after he had left the show. Okay. So you would have thought you were on pretty okay terms with him, would you? Absolutely. We were very friendly to each other. And at no time did he ever say that any of our uh, horseplay had upset him in any way, shape or form. Chase, you got that, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's nice. That was nice. I thought I'd let him have it. I mean, I've collected so many awards. I know. This one already. <laughs> it's just like share, share it out. Spread the love. 
Namaste. I guess that's one way to describe laziness. (laughs) (laughs) Kevin, I'm interested in the power dynamic at play in these accusations, because as a Hollywood star, double Oscar winner, how aware were you that you exerted, you know, a powerful hold and a fascination for these guys? Some of them called themselves, you know, I was just a, a nobody. And was there no part of you that ever chose to exploit that power? I'm a kid from South Orange, New Jersey, who was raised in Southern California in very, very um, more than modest surroundings. Uh, in fact, my my father was employed unemployed so often that by the time I think I was 10, we'd moved about eight times. Um, I came from nothing, and I have not spent my life looking at myself the way other people see me. Um, I look at myself as unbelievably fortunate and incredibly lucky to have had uh, people believe in me when I started out and to have been given the opportunities that I've had. And, you know, there's power dynamics in every relationship. And but uh, in in the way that I conducted myself, I, I, I would think that if I had been promising people, well, you know, if you uh, if you come into my trailer, uh, why uh, I'm going to, you know, give you a part in a show or I'll give you an audition or uh, I never uh, in any way, um, use the position I was in as a quid pro quo. Doesn't mean I didn't believe in people. Doesn't mean I didn't support people. Doesn't mean I didn't recommend people to a director who I believed in. But I, I, there was no price to pay. There was no quid pro quo. I, I, absolutely not. Now, it appears when I hear about what some of the accusers are saying that in their own minds, They thought because I'd had a 15 minute conversation with them or got stoned with them or had a drink with them that I was now going to be their mentor, which is not what was occurring. And I also think mentorship is mentorship is something that's very serious. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some mentors in my life, and I've certainly mentored people myself. But not every person I meet just because I'm asking them questions and because I happen to be an actor and a famous one means that I'm making a promise that I'm going to be their um, their way into the industry and they're going to have a career just because I paid attention to them. It's, it's just not what was happening. All right, Chase, what do you got? So let's understand this question she asked versus the answer Kevin provided. She's saying... I'm paraphrasing here. How uh, aware are you that you had a powerful hold or fascination for these guys? Essentially asking, is he aware that this level of status and authority were influential and powerful? And he had the capacity to make people become more compliant, perhaps. His answer was about quid pro quo, promises and favors, and is not at all what she asked about. So let's talk very quickly about the behavioral stuff that's going on here, since we're the behavior panel. What are the psychological effects of people who are in the presence of people who have tons of social status or they're perceived as an authority? You don't have to have real authority. You just have to have the perception of it. So it's fascinating and a little scary how deeply embedded the response to social status is and authority inside of our psychology. It's in every one of us. And this is deeply rooted in our DNA, in our evolutionary past, where disobeying an authority figure like a tribal leader could mean that we would get killed or face some hard consequences. A really good illustration of this is the famous Milgram experiment from the 1960s, where these participants in the experiment were willing to administer what they believed were severely painful electric shocks to a total stranger just because some dude in a lab coat told them to do it. So it shows how normal uh, everyday people can be made to do extreme stuff under the influence of authority. So keep this in mind, this heightened level of suggestibility uh, comes from the way that our brains are wired to respond to authority cues like uniforms, titles, celebrity status. When that occurs, 
Critical thinking takes a back seat and it makes people way more compliant and uh, susceptible to suggestions, even when those are not in our best interest or our ethical standards. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I find this, uh, number one, I agree with everything you're saying there. And I find it incredible, again, how naive he seems to be or want to be perceived as not understanding that power dynamic that was there and the compliance that he could create with somebody. Um, And uh, not answering the question of effectively, you know, how drunk were you on your power? Uh, I think that that he's... He's going along with like 99.9% of Hollywood who is just so severely out of touch with reality that they, he may not be faking this at all. Well, again, that's why I'm I'm going, I'm, I'm not quite sure why he is so naive or appears so naive. To your point, Chase, maybe it is because he's absolutely not in touch with that. I remember in London when Kevin Spacey showed up and it's it's a big thing to have such a big Hollywood star running a theatre. This is, you know, the, the, the king of Hollywood running a grassroots theatre. Uh, so it was an extraordinary thing. And... Um, and so uh, just a massive amount of cachet and power and romance uh, around him, just Hollywood romance in the heart of, of, of London. Um, and, and essentially, you're right, Chase, he doesn't answer the question of, of did you ever, you know, use that power? What he does is he starts the narrative of I came from nothing, my dad came from nothing. That's not our answer to that question. That's, uh, well, to your, uh, Chase, I think it's a resume statement, essentially. It's a, it's a screenplay. <laughs> it's a screenplay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? It, more importantly, <clears throat> it is a chaff and redirect. The yeah. rational answer to a compound question is an answer, not that. So let's walk through a couple of things. Chase, you brought it up. Mark, you brought up a second thing. But the Zimbardo experiment is as applicable as anything we talk about here, the prison experiment. What we know is that when you cloister people, when they get into a contained environment and there's an alpha, they have more of a tendency to allow things to happen. They should look at every cult that's ever existed. You create an alpha that is the one and people try to emulate and become more like. That person, the Zimbardo in the Zimbardo experiment, They ended up doing fake sexual acts and all that kind of stuff, forcing these so-called prisoners who were actors, both were actors, both were volunteers, to force these sexual things that were odd that also happened in Abu Ghraib 2004 in Baghdad. So all of this stuff is deep in human psyches, deep in there. It's so creepy that it's as deeply embedded in us as it is. But go read that. Zimbardo experiment and the Milgram experiment, and you'll see two very powerful things. Now, talk about theater, talk about movie sets, talk about that. Those are cloistered environments. Mark, you've been worked in those places. They are very confined. And then I would say talent takes a whole new level when they're in the room. They're going to more privacy and that kind of thing. When she asks this question, she locks him down. She doesn't give him a lot of wiggle room, and that's the reason he chaffs to get out of it. She says, How aware were you that you exerted? Well, he rambles about his background, about his family, about his chickens and dogs, whatever else he had for one solid minute without answering the question. Then he says it was not quid pro quo, which might be true. He may have never said, if you do this, I'll do that. He may have never said, you have to do this for me to do that. That, That's true. But he knew the dynamic. And if you don't believe that, go back and listen to this final rant. He talks about the dynamic of power between people. If he knew that, now I agree with you guys, it might have been normal there, normal in the environment he was in and accepted. It, look, if you go way back in cultures, the military had to make rules against it. So that should tell you something. Business had to make rules against all this kind of thing. So all of this could still be true, but he states in the very end of that, that he understands the power differential. And then he does lip compression without eye closure, which tells me he's not on the same ground as he was back here when he had this guy who had shown some compromising photos. He doesn't show that same thing with that chin that we saw earlier, showing that he accepts things in that case either. There's one place in here he does, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, Scott, is it you? Yeah, yeah. In the Milgram uh, uh, studies, I thought one of the most fascinating things was as they would, what happened was, like Chase was explaining, they'd have a, um, somebody come in and they and they told them, look, and it was a student and said, look, what we want you to do is, uh, 
every time I tell you to just ramp the voltage up, we're going to shock this person. In a nutshell, that's what was happening. And so they ramp it up and you hear the person holler and then they do something, you know, the the person doing the test or whatever would say something, okay, well, shock him again, turn it up to whatever. And they were telling this, these unbelievable, uh, this unbelievable voltage they would goose them with supposedly and they weren't. And it got to a point where for almost every one of them, when they got so high and they'd do it, there would make, there'd be no noise. And they'd say, he's not, he's not yelling anymore. He's not hollering. And they could just do it again. Just do, it. and they would still do it. That was all so crazy about that. So if you're if you're into that kind of thing, there, it's a great read. But I think there's also uh, there's a video of that as well. I think there's a really somewhere. good video. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that is, um, I, I think that that's just mind blowing. How you can, what are you going to say, Greg? I think a lot of them were returned soldiers too. The culture was in a place of compliance more than it is today, for sure. Okay. Social compliance. Yeah. Okay. So, in, well, anyway, so back to our videos. This is where it gets really interesting for me because when he says, I never used that position, uh, the position I was in as a quid pro quo. And everybody noticed when he did that, you see that shoulder, that short shoulder shrug, quick one, and that chin goes over there. Maybe four times since we've been doing this, we've seen someone do that in, a, in, in videos and they weren't being dishonest. I think. If I had to vote right now on this very, on the very specific she's talking about in this, I think this one might have happened. I think this one might be true. Just lean on that one thing. There are no absolutes. You can't say every time that happens that, it, that that's true. But, man, this gives me the feeling, along with everything else, that this one might have happened. So I can be wrong. It's just my opinion. I'll leave it there. Yeah, Mark, you were in first and strong, yeah. man. So that's what happens, Chase, when you call me lazy. I come back. I come back strong. Oh, Chase, man. So you're going to take still. that off of him? I was Kevin, <laughs> I was Kevin spacing out. Uh, <laughs> oh, do you, you know you didn't? Oh. You're going to have to do an apology video for that one. Kevin, I'm interested in the power dynamic at play in these accusations because as a Hollywood star, double Oscar winner, how aware were you that you exerted, you know, a powerful hold and a fascination for these guys? Some of them called themselves, you know, I was just a, a nobody. And was there no part of you that ever chose to exploit that power? Yeah. I'm a kid from South Orange, New Jersey, who was raised in Southern California in very, very um, more than modest surroundings. Uh, in fact, my my father was employed, unemployed so often that by the time I think I was 10, we'd moved about eight times. Um, I came from nothing and I have not spent my life looking at myself the way other people see me. Um, I look at myself as unbelievably fortunate and incredibly lucky to have had uh, people believe in me when I started out and to have been given the opportunities that I've had. And, you know, there's power dynamics in every relationship. And, but uh, in, in the way that I conducted myself, I, I, I would think that if I had been promising people, well, you know, if you, uh, if you come into my trailer, uh, why uh, I'm going to, you know, give you a part in a show or I'll give you an audition or uh, I never, uh, in any way, um, use the position I was in as a quid pro quo. Doesn't mean I didn't believe in people. Doesn't mean I didn't support people. Doesn't mean I didn't recommend people to a director who I believed in. But I, I, there was no price to pay. There was no quid pro quo. I, I, absolutely not. Now, it appears when I hear about what some of the accusers are saying, that in their own minds, they thought because I'd had a 15 minute conversation with them or got stoned with them or had a drink with them that I was now going to be their mentor, which is not what was occurring. And I also think mentorship is mentorship is something that's very serious. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some mentors in my life, and I've certainly mentored people myself. But not every person I meet just because I'm asking them questions and because I happen to be an actor and a famous one means that I'm making a promise that I'm going to be their, um, their way into the industry and they're going to have a career 
just because I paid attention to them. It's, it's just not what was happening. Are you, are you honestly saying that there is no point in which you get the fame you had and where you don't flex that power in some way? Yeah, but in the tiniest ways, you know, it's like, oh, you can get a, a good table at a restaurant and you can get, you know, a nice airline seat. And, you know, I mean, people treat you very well. And I'm not an idiot. I know when I walk into a room, people see me and they, it may well change the way they react to me. But I, I've not spent my life trying to take advantage of people because of the position I've been in. I've been incredibly fortunate and I've tried to I've tried to be able to spread that and 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 put a spotlight on other people and, and help them in their lives. Uh, in, in your interview with Dan Wharton, you said, I take full responsibility for my past behavior and my actions. What behavior and actions were you referring to? I'm behaving poorly, doing inappropriate things. I completely understand and, and, and accept that. And if anyone thinks that I haven't been focused on growing and becoming a better person as a result of what I've been through and what I've learned in the last seven years, if anybody thinks that I don't sorely regret the mistakes that I've made or the choices that I've made or that I hurt anyone along the way, then you just aren't aware of the personal work that I've been doing for the last seven years. And, and anyone who thinks that I'm going to give up on acting has got me wrong on all counts. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? There's a deep swallow in the start, and we're all giggling because we just watched the same thing. But there's a deep swallow in the start that because this is going the wrong way for him. You can see that. And then that single shoulder shrug and that point with the chin that Scott just talked about in the last video is there. Yeah, yeah. And he sounds like John Lovitz from you know Saturday Night Live years ago, doing this thing all at the same time. All of that is fight or flight. It changes the pitch of our voice as things happen. The respiration is up, his blink rate's up. All of those things are fight or flight. The organism's trying to protect itself and it's going to just respond. He actually gets pretty rigid as he moves around and he's illustrating airline, airline seats and tables. His movement has now gotten rigid. And I often say it's not just your speech patterns that the cadence changes on, but how quickly you shift from movement to movement. And we're seeing the use of that. There's a rare, rare use of his forehead in request for approval. He, I, like I said before, he's got a kind of concrete growl. But here when he says, I put the spotlight on other people and he raises his brow. He probably does. He probably does believe that. And I think that's him genuinely saying, look, I do this. Don't you understand? Then he does some downright eye accessing after that comment, after she's gone at him pretty hard. And I think it's probably emotion associated with which way this, I don't think it's about something he's recalling. I think it's associated with where this is going. Because right after that, his mouth gets narrow, his respiration's up and his jaw is set. That's anger. That's anger. And then... Uh, just a couple others. I got a ton of stuff here. When he's asked about his actions, he starts to sh to kind of short stroke his head no and uses euphemistic language that says exactly what she said, not illustrating. She said, what were your bad actions? Well, there were bad actions, basically is what he says. And now he's lost eye contact. It, it, he says what I've, what I've been through, what I've learned, it's about him again. This is why I think while he may feel remorse or whatever, I think like you said earlier, Chase, and like we all said, it might have been normal. And people age into that organisms done what made the organism successful and don't evolve with times around them. And sometimes they never change. But the last thing he says, I think, is probably the most genuine thing I've seen in this entire video. And it's when he loses his ability to really express what he's saying when he's talking about acting and he's stumbling over the words. I think he's actually really emotional there. And I think that's the crux of the matter. Don't want to lose the acting, but some of the stuff I did, eh. Scott, what do you got? All right. What's inter interesting to me is how much he moves around when he talks about how much he helps people. I thought that was kind of interesting. Now he's uncomfortable doing that. So I can't tell from what we're looking at, whether he's uncomfortable because he's saying I'm doing all this nice stuff and he's not the, maybe he's not the kind of guy that will says he does all this nice and good stuff. I don't know. Never met the guy. And I've, I've seen many interviews with him where that would come up. So, but I thought that was, that was fairly interesting uh, what was happening there. But I, I, I think it, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm not going to say that. I got to watch that. Um, but when you brag about something, 
usually your eyebrows go up and you have a request for, for approval, which is another thing, Greg Coin. Your eyebrows, and, and I really, you know, it's just one of those things I love to do because it helps the children. And so their eyebrows go up. And we're not seeing a lot of that there. They go up and down and all that, but they don't go up and lock as he's doing that. So they're, they're, I think there's something to that. Um, and then um, I think he's being honest when he talks about the growing up and trying to be a better person. You know, I think that that's probably actually from the heart. He probably means that. He's probably been thinking about this. Obviously, he's had a lot of time to think about it. He's like, yeah, I got to be, I got to be a better person. I got to get a handle on this if he's done something wrong. <laughs> I don't want to say that's coming from the position of it being, but he says he does some wrong stuff, some bad stuff. So, uh, I don't know. This is, this is, this is turning bad for him. So I'm not saying he didn't do a lot of things that, that he shouldn't have done. I'm just saying he looks like he means what he says when he says he's sorry that, that he did, um, some things he shouldn't have done. So I just want to, I, I don't know how to make you any clear about what I'm saying. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I think the interview here is is great because she's incredulous about him never flexing his power. She pushes on it. And I think we get a confession from him. We certainly get the biggest move from baseline that we have from him, that high-pitched voice, the look across, you know, the the, the instability of that moment. Um, and he says, you know, just, just little things. So a little micro confession there. He's confessing to doing just little things. And, and I think uh, he shows disdain on that as well. I think he feels like he shouldn't be called out on these little things. Because again, and, and, and Chase, I don't get it. I don't, I, but it could be that Hollywood thing of he's just so departed from the rest of the world that he doesn't quite get it. That a little thing for him could be the biggest thing for somebody else. He's at such a high status that a little thing for him to somebody of low status could mean the absolute world. And he doesn't seem to recognize that, or maybe he does, and he does show disdain for that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, and I agree with y'all. I agree with everybody here. And for you watching, I'm going to change the way that you hear what's in this clip permanently and also how you hear statements like this in your own life. When somebody over apologizes, especially in a situation where it feels a little out of place or a little excessive, it's usually a red flag that there's more under the surface. So this can indicate that the person's trying to compensate for something that they feel guilty about or they might be trying to deflect some kind of further uh, inquiry into the into the issue. So now when somebody talks extensively about how they've worked hard to fix their personal issues, it can serve uh, maybe a dual purpose. The first thing it does is it acts as a form of mini confession. It helps it. We have this need to confess as humans where they acknowledge these past faults, but they also try to reassure whoever's listening that these issues are resolved. So it's like they're saying, yes, I have these problems, but I've dealt with these. So it can be a, a subconscious effort to kind of cleanse your palate for being pissed off. The second thing that it does is just by emphasizing their transformation and their efforts to change, they're essentially framing themselves as a brand new person. So this narrative can be kind of strategic to create some mental separation from past behaviors and demonstrate that anything anything that happened back then, any misconduct, that was not me. So this was crafted to foster forgiveness and understanding. And I can say that we're also not fans of the innuendo and all that stuff here on the behavior panel. If you agree, uh, drop an eggplant emoji in the chat to let Scott know that you're thinking about him. Are you, are you, honestly saying that there is no point in which you get the fame you had and where you don't flex that power in some way. Yeah, but in the tiniest ways, you know, it's like, oh, you can get a, a good table at a restaurant and you can get, you know, a nice airline seat. And, you know, I mean, people treat you very well. And I'm not an idiot. I know when I walk into a room, people see me and they, it may well change the way they react to me. But I've not spent my life trying to take advantage of people because of the position I've been in. I've been incredibly fortunate and I've tried to I've tried to be able to spread that and and, and put a spotlight on other people and and help them in their lives. 
Uh, in, in your interview with Dan Wharton, you said, I take full responsibility for my past behaviour and my actions. What behaviour and actions were you referring to? I'm behaving poorly, doing inappropriate things. I completely understand and, and, and accept that. And if anyone thinks that I haven't been focused on growing and becoming a better person as a result of what I've been through and what I've learned in the last seven years, if anybody thinks that I don't sorely regret the mistakes that I've made or the choices that I've made or that I hurt anyone along the way, then you just aren't aware of the personal work that I've been doing for the last seven years. And, and anyone who thinks that I'm going to give up on acting has got me wrong on all counts. In 2017, when you were at the height of your success and in, you know, being amazing in House of Cards, this guy you mentioned before, Anthony Rapp, accused you of making sexual advances to him in 1986 when he was 14 years old. And then you, you released a statement in which you said you didn't remember the encounter, but you were extremely sorry if it had taken place. And you also chose that statement to disclose that you were living as a gay man. Can you tell us why did you apologize? And do you regret now coming out in that same statement? Well, there's no question that the two statements should have been separated. Um, in my mind, in my heart, I knew that I hadn't done what he accused me of doing. But he backed me into a corner because when you say, oh, you were so drunk, you won't remember. I mean, look, the first thing that I think if someone heard that, I'm accusing you of something that happened more than 30 years ago and you won't remember because you were too drunk. The first thing I did was not say this person's lying. The first thing I did was go, what? Did I, what? Like I had to look at myself and say, is it possible that? So I wasn't in a position at that point to absolutely deny it. I was also conscious of the fact, and there were lots of voices in my head uh, actually talking to me, advisors and such who were saying, you know, you, you can't push back on this. You have to be kind. There was all kinds of pressure. And again, BuzzFeed gave us a few hours to respond to this 31-year-old charge before they went to print. And... I'm not sure I could have done anything that would have been the right thing or sounded right. It even all sounded wrong to me. Um, but also because what many people may not know, unless they watch the, the Dan Wooten interview, is that I had been talking about and planning about coming out for more than two years. And so in my own mind, I had made the decision to come out. It's not that Anthony Rapp made me come out. It's that I was like, I was going to do this anyway, so let's just try to do something positive because so many people in the gay community have been asking me to come out, and I felt like I just didn't see. I knew I wasn't guilty, so I didn't I didn't connect the two things, and I understand now why it was seen the way it was seen. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he's back at his home turf. This He's talking about an accuser he's gone to court over, so he knows how to deal with it. And she gives him the chance, but he doesn't separate the two questions about coming out and about issuing an apology to this kid. If he was smart, he would have done that, separated him out and gone right down the path and said, look, I issued an apology. It was ill-advised. I was not in the place I'm in now. But he doesn't. He confuses the two and ties them back together. And then we get that same back. Remember, early in this video, I said, I see a pattern of do what you have to do here. I'm accepting it. I'm accepting it. I see it again. Now, when I see this, I never, he doesn't say that he never denies this could have happened with this kid, never denies it could have happened. He says some long drawn out thing, and it was when I was coming out, and, and, and. This makes me feel really uncomfortable. And the only time I've seen him grab his nose before this was when he was very emotional and stumbling over his words in the last video. If there's a non answer whether he did it or not. That's avoidance to me all day. He could, could have come right out and said, didn't do it. You know, I made a mistake by issuing an apology because I was in a place, but he never comes out and says, I didn't do it. He says, I was drunk. Maybe I was too drunk. I don't know. That's all I got. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And one big thing that people might miss in this interview is that Spacey never gives a firm denial of the accusations here. Instead, his reaction 
I think shows a lot about how people process such intense situations. Let's break down the statement really quick and reveal a few things that are hidden inside of it. When Spacey says, the first thing I did not, or I did was not say, this person is lying. The first thing I did was go, what? And then what? He's showing a moment of self-reflection. And this is a really important behavioral cue. Uh, instead of outright denying the claim, he questions himself. Think about this for a second. This self-doubt can indicate that even if he does not remember the event, he recognizes the possibility, the capacity for this to have happened. So especially since he mentions being intoxicated, this kind of response is typical when somebody's unsure of their past actions, but they're acknowledging the potential for inappropriate behavior. And Spacey's interview is a good example of the nuanced ways that people respond to allegations. And he doesn't firmly deny the claims. He shows self-reflection, which is rare, and acknowledges that there's a capacity there. So it kind of reminds us our reactions in, in these situations like this can be a mix of all kinds of weird stuff, context, like we talked about earlier, that makes a big difference. Uh, and that's, that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, look, he says he was backed into a corner here. And so let's just take in if that's correct. It's not just a, uh, well, it is a metaphor, but essentially he's hit fight and flight in this situation. And that's why he's saying he conflates, he puts together the the um, the sexual abuse kind of claim and, um, or the impropriety, uh, impropriety claim and him coming out and those get put together and it's unstrategic. Uh, he's overwhelmed with opinions from other people. It's a snap judgment and a bad decision. But he says, I was backed up against a corner. So again, it kind of speaks to the idea of he's either he's able to be really naive, which I don't quite get, or he's playing at being naive. And uh, potentially he has the ability to hit fight and flight in, in situations. He's maybe not a good CEO of his life. Things don't hit him and he thinks carefully about them and goes, well, here's the message I'll put out. He just goes into action and and uh and makes mistakes and he does say so he does say i knew i wasn't guilty so you're right it's not a firm denial but it's somewhat of a denial i knew i wasn't guilty look there there may be a you could kind of poke at that and go well were you deluded by that knowing uh so, interesting. Uh, Scott, what do you got on that one? All right. I think this is where the acting part comes in because we see him check his notes. This is where you can see what's actually happening. I've been saying he looks to his right because it's over there right for me, but it's to the left. And you can see his eyes go over as she's talking and he's reading really fast and you can see his eyes going back and forth really fast. Then you hear a little click. So I don't know if he's clicking a mouse on a computer or what, but there's definitely a little click there. So I think he's he's going over notes. You know, I, th I think that's what's happening to make sure he's got, he's got, he's, he makes sure he says everything he wants to say or get everything he wants said, said in that. So when you watch this for a second time, watch it, watch how his eyes focus over there on something to the left and watch how his eyes go back and forth. It's, it's not like he's doing like this. Like we all have stuff on our screens. I think we all do. I know most of us do. And so when we go back, Mark, you're reading from a little. Yeah, little I'm just nose down here. Okay. Well, I think the rest of us have stuff on our screen. So you see us going back and forth like I am now. But um, but his his is really small because I was going back and forth like that. So I don't think this whole this section, this video, this answer was very good for him because I think he's he's I understand he's trying to get back into acting, trying to get hired again. But hopefully this has, this one hasn't sealed his doom uh, with these answers in this one because I think he's being honest at the beginning of the group of these videos or at, the, at this vid group of videos, and now I think he's being honest, but he's he's talking about these ideas and feelings and stories that are that could possibly be true that are really bad for him, I think. So I don't think this makes him look very good. Is that all of us? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Mark, I busted your groove coming in like that, dude. I'm sorry. And Scott, I'm sorry, man. I meant to call you before, Mark, so you weren't last again. Oh, it's okay. Still, you still, it's okay. 
I'm used to it. <laughs> you haven't been last every time this time. No, there are two times I wasn't. <laughs> okay, in 2017, when you were at the height of your success and in, you know, being amazing in House of Cards, this guy you mentioned before, Anthony Rapp, accused you of making sexual advances to him in 1986 when he was 14 years old. And then you, you released a statement in which you said you didn't remember the encounter, but you were extremely sorry if it had taken place. And you also chose that statement to disclose that you were living as a gay man. Can you tell us why did you apologize? And do you regret now coming out in that same statement? Well, there's no question that the two statements should have been separated. Um, in my mind, in my heart, I knew that I hadn't done what he accused me of doing. But he backed me into a corner because when you say, oh, you were so drunk, you won't remember. I mean, look, the first thing that I think if someone heard that, I'm accusing you of something that happened more than 30 years ago and you won't remember because you were too drunk. The first thing I did was not say this person's lying. The first thing I did was go, what? Did I, what? Like I had to look at myself and say, is it possible that? So I wasn't in a position at that point to absolutely deny it. I was also conscious of the fact, and there were lots of voices in my head uh, actually talking to me, advisors and such who were saying, you know, you, you can't push back on this. You have to be kind. There was all kinds of pressure. And again, BuzzFeed gave us a few hours to respond to this 31-year-old charge before they went to print. And... I'm not sure I could have done anything that would have been the right thing or sounded right. It even all sounded wrong to me. Um, but also because what many people may not know, unless they watch the, the Dan Wooten interview, is that I had been talking about and planning about coming out for more than two years. And so in my own mind, I had made the decision to come out. It's not that Anthony Rapp made me come out. It's that I was like, I was going to do this anyway, so let's just try to do something positive because so many people in the gay community have been asking me to come out, and I felt like I just didn't see. I knew I wasn't guilty, so I didn't I didn't connect the two things, and I understand now why it was seen the way it was seen. All right, we just broke all this behavior down, and we've made decisions about what we think. What do you think? Mark, tell us what you think. Yeah, and I mean, clearly there's some kind of micro confessions going on there. He's denying, I guess, the the bigger stuff, but 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 essentially, there's he's he's been up to some stuff. He says it himself that is reprehensible in some way. Um, look, here's what I would say about it: is I think it's a Spider Man quote, isn't it? With great power comes great responsibility, and you know, if you have power. I would think you have to look after every decision that you're making. And I find it personally a little naive that he hasn't looked after every decision that he's been making. I find it extraordinary that he's got himself into this position. But it seems like he's the kind of person that just hasn't understood the power that he has and understood that he needs to look after all of, all of his behaviours in order to come out of that power squeaky clean, and he hasn't. He's not clean. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, good quote from Uncle Ben there. He yeah. <laughs> took care of Peter Parker for a long time, has great rice, uh, and a lot of good stuff. So uh, this whole thing is a mix of well-worded responses that are mostly genuine and slightly evasive. Uh, I think he's definitely confident there's no evidence that's going to show he's guilty. Whether it's because he's innocent or someone can't prove it, I'm not sure, of, of course. Here's the main thing I'm seeing in all this behavior. I think he's internally using his own goodness in a way to feel less stress and guilt about all of this. I don't think that he acted uh, like some of these other dipshits in Hollywood uh, who were very obviously acting with malice and knowingly hurtful behavior. I think uh, it's true for him, for maybe his his truth, that he didn't do those things with malice. 
And it's also his internal way of dealing with the stuff that's that's coming at him. So I'd love to be able to write some questions uh, so more of the truth comes out. But that's what I think is going on. Greg? Chase, I agree with you. I don't think he's malicious. I think what we're seeing here is a culture that evolved, and he probably was a good part of that culture, and things that they got away with and did were inappropriate. Now, I don't know. When there's a 14-year-old accusation, if that has any credence, that's far from just the culture. That's inappropriate on all levels. However, I think when he is talking about this, he saw it as, okay, it's okay for us to do this. It kind of was the culture they were in. So things change. You wouldn't want to take your grandparents to certain kind of parties because, you know, they would not fit in with that same culture and things change and people change. The world has changed around him some, I think. And he never says, I'm a saint, ever, ever. And when people are telling you, often when we get a guy who is trying to make himself out to be a saint, they'll trade guilt. They'll say, yeah, I, I do this and I do that. They won't say, yeah, I did this much of that. They're going to not give you a lesser degree of the same crime. They're going to give you a different crime. So he is doing that. Here's the question. Did he learn what's acceptable and just going to follow it because he has to? Or does he agree? It doesn't really matter as long as he follows the rules and doesn't do anything that will get him in trouble. I don't particularly care for speeding laws, but I have to follow them. Hmm. Scott, what do you got? Fascinating. So, yeah, I think... What's happened here is he's come to the point where he's doing what he thinks he's supposed to do because he wants to, to still work, you know? So what else do you want? The guy's coming out saying, I did a bunch of horrible stuff, you know? And maybe he's not saying, he's not getting into the details because he don't want to open up a bunch of little, little cans of worms in there, but he's doing what he's supposed to do. And when the, whatever it is comes for him, they came for him and he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do, you know? So I, I think, I think, I think he'll he'll well, I think we'll see him again. I think we'll see him act again, but I bet his behavior will be a whole lot different. Everybody'll be on you know, they'll be on point for keeping an eye on him and he'll know that, you know, and he's not gonna want to do anything like that again. I think you're right, it comes to culture back then. You could do a lot of stuff that you couldn't do, obviously now. So I think he'll I I think he's he's in the the cleanup mode and this is one of the things he has to do. So he's doing it so he can get back into into to acting, doing things like doing more than anybody. And he's great at it. He's an awesome actor. So he's doing what he's asked to be, what's asked of him. He's doing it. So in other words, he's paying the price. It may be a year or so, but he, I think he'll be back. I think he'll be back. All right, fellas. Thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got? <laughs>